Welcome to the first annual Liberty Award, which was presented to Admiral Thomas H. Moore at the Army Navy Club, Washington, D.C., on September 21, 1999. Among the guests and speakers were 20 admirals, seven Navy captains, a Medal of Honor recipient, survivors of the USS Liberty, and other interested parties. The media was invited, but none attended. Jim Hessman, the editor-in-chief of Sea Power magazine. From the State Department, we have Peter Bolton, one of my favorites, Andy Kilgore. One of the best writers on the Middle East, Dick Curtis. Where is Dick? There we go. And um, from academia, Professor Sharabi. Okay. Joan Drake. Joan. Oh, good, okay. Dr. Crow, Colonel Crow, where are, where are you? How are you? Oh, okay. Fine. And Albert Mukhaiver, where's Albert? Good to have you here. I want to read something from Ambassador Bill Middendorf, who couldn't attend. He says, um, I very much regret that I cannot be with you for the presentation of the Liberty Award to my good friend and longtime mentor, Admiral Tom Moore. I would appreciate if you would pass on the following message. To the officers and crew of the USS Liberty, I am honored to join in this salute to Admiral Thomas H. Moore, one of the greatest naval leaders of this century. On a personal basis, I am pleased to extend my own best wishes and respectful admiration to the officers and crew of the Liberty themselves. You have served your country with dedication and courage and will never be forgotten. The presentation of the first annual Liberty Award to Admiral Moore is particularly appropriate. He is a patriot, a hero in both peace and war, and one of America's most admired leaders. I have uh, another thing I'd like to uh, have read to you. This is from the daughters of Captain McGonagall, who was buried in Arlington on April 9th. And uh, this is, will be read by a Liberty survivor, uh, Joe Lantini. Where are you, Joe? Would you please come up here and read this for us? Yeah, last night, Cindy McGonagall, or day before yesterday, Cindy McGonagall called me. And she said she and her sister Sandy had prayed long and hard about this day for you, sir. And they wanted to express not only their thoughts, but the thoughts of their father. Okay, it's very short. Admiral Moore, on behalf of our dad, Captain William L. McGonagall, former commander of the USS Liberty, we would like you to know that your camaraderie, your friendship, leadership, and words of wisdom had always been a source of hope and encouragement to him. We all honor you today for your service on behalf of the USS Liberty. May her memory never be forgotten. And it signed sincerely, Cindy and Sandy McGonagall. So I won't be upstairs after so <clears throat> mention a personal uh, conversation I had with Admiral Morris some months ago. I asked him why uh, he and Artie Burke was, got so involved and were really responsible for the building of, of the Navy Memorial. So he looked around and he said, because on every square in Washington, D.C., there's some damn general on a horse. <laughs> Our first uh, heavy speaker today is going to be Admiral Bill Hauser. And uh, 
I, I was so intimidated when he sent me his bio that I, 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 I finally wound up just throwing a dart. Uh, but some of the more important things, uh, he was commanding officer of the U.S. Constellation. Uh, he's director of aviation plans requirements for the Office of Chief of, Chief of Naval Operations. He was commander carrier division of the U.S. Atlantic Fleet, and he was deputy chief of naval operations. No? As I told Tito, whom I've only met today in person, but we've talked several times, uh, it doesn't take a 10-minute introduction for a five-minute speech. <laughs> so uh, this is going to be uh, short. This is not on my time. Tito asked me to do this. He asked me to read off the number and the types of medals, decorations, and awards given to the Liberty for their valiant stand on that horrible day in the Eastern Mediterranean. One medal of honor to the commanding officer, which I think is from what I understand has been thoroughly supported and subscribed by everybody on there. They love the man. Two Navy Crosses, our next to highest award, 11 Silver Stars, 20 Bronze Stars, 204 Purple Hearts, and you know, you know what those are for. They should be Red Hearts because that's for blood. The Presidential Unit Citation, and overall with this crew of 297, 294, 294, 834 uh, awards, decorations, and medals. And that, I guess, is probably a record, and they certainly deserve it. <laughs> Some years ago, I learned that what can be well said in 10 minutes often can be very well said in five, and I'll try to do that. <laughs> Uh, we're going to hear a lot about our favorite person, Admiral Moore, and I'll just give you a couple of three items that come to my attention in a short period. Uh, he has many characteristics, essentially all of them good. We haven't asked Carrie about all of these, but nonetheless, uh, we, we recognize him for all the good things he's done. One I would like to bring out is strength. This is characteristic of Tom Moore. He's strong. If he believes in something, even though it's not popular, even though it's not the majority, he will stand up and he will defend it. Whether it's a liberty, and the liberty has had its bad times in the press, of course, whether it's nuclear weapons, whether it's ballistic missile defenses, or a whole host of things. Tom Moore is a person you can depend on, and he defends it. And if you don't believe some of these things that he says, I challenge you, try to make an appointment and go talk to him because when you do, you come out of a labor. Uh, the second one I would bring up, and this is very important, you got courage. He's got courage to carry through on what is necessary. And there's one story that I'm going to tell, which to me epitomizes him and separates him from nearly everybody else I know. Now, how many of you were here in December 1972? That was just before the Vietnam War. Anyway, I was here and I was in town. And uh, the Christmas bombing, as it was called, of North Vietnam started. Well, it was sort of a bad time of the year to do that. Christmas, a fellowship to all, and uh, so forth. And it was just not a right time. You can't select a good time, but nonetheless, it was a necessary time. Adam Moore convinced the president, then Richard Nixon, that there's one way to get these people out of prison and war camp, which they've been uh, there for a long time, and also to end this war. The war ended in October, but it didn't stop then because North Vietnamese were satisfied not to let it go. They brought out the big guns, the B 52s, the Washington Post, all of the media, all the spokes around here were just yelling and screaming, principally at Mr. Nixon, but also his military advisors. Tom stood up stood firm, we got that campaign over, the North Vietnamese, the Vietnamese capitulated, they turned our prisoners loose, and I personally believe that if it hadn't been for people like Tom Moore, Jim Stockdale, and some of those wonderful people would still be there. But Tom Moore was the guy who held the president's feet to the fire, 
and the weapons on target. Nice moment, Tom. The last one I would uh, say is judgment. We had strength, we had courage, we had judgment. Uh, he's always very facile in taking all the factors together and rendering a judgment. And I guess the best evidence of this that I can see where he used supreme judgment, which has lasted him well most of his life, is when he took for his bride Carrie Foy. And I think this has been the most wonderful union that I've seen in or out of the military. I just spent a couple of weeks with him at close range on the uh, trip to Midway Island this summer and to Hawaii. We had several big occasions and I was introducing Tom most of the time. But the point of it is, I would like to say that one of the real strengths of Tom Moore is Carrie. I'm going to exercise my judgments and sit down. Thank you. <laughs> well, you know, when you're, you're an old Air Force guy yourself and surrounded with this much Navy, the only safe way out is to keep your right hand a tough Marine. <laughs> Let me tell you how tough this Marine is. 1965, he received our nation's highest award, the Congressional Medal of Honor. He's also head of that organization. I understand there, have to check on this weekly, but 154 living. 153, we lost one last week. Uh, so you gotta keep up. Anyway, I'm going to read just the first and last sentences of his uh, award. Um, he, uh, in a very difficult time in Vietnam in 65, and the casualties were heavier after 10 in 68. But let me just read this, uh, we call him Barney, Colonel Barney. <clears throat> For conspicuous gallantry at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty. His gallant initiative and heroic conduct reflected great credit upon himself and were in keeping with the highest traditions of the Marine Corps and the United States Navy. Thank you very much. I'm very proud and, and honored to be invited here today and, and represent the, the 153 living recipients of the Medal of Honor. To join with my fellow Americans who have served in the profession of arms in the defense of freedom. This gathering here today in this, in this beautiful facility with so much history is a demonstration of patriotism a chance to, to demonstrate our love of this great country while at the same time singling out and honoring great men like Admiral Moore, Captain Bill McGonigal, and most importantly, the crew of the Liberty. The Medal of Honor is, is only bestowed on those who have performed an act of such conspicuous gallantry as to raise above and beyond the call of duty. Captain Bill truly raised to the occasion. His loyalty drove him to scale the heights of courage and strength for his crew, the entire ship, the Liberty, at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty. Our country's brave humanitarian and gallant heritage is now narrated to the life and deeds, thoughts and aspirations of heroic deeds of men like Bill McGonigal as living testimony of America's greatness. And when I first met Captain Bill at one of our Medal of Honor conventions, as we usually get off the bus or at the airplane, there's always a newspaper person there with a microphone and a camera. And I can recall someone asking Captain McGonigal why he had the Medal of Honor. What did he do? And his only comment was, you can look it up, but I wear this medal in honor of those great corpsmen, those great sailors, 
the civilians and the three Marines that served on the Liberty. I didn't know much about the Liberty and what had happened. I don't think America did until his passing. And at that time, I read the exploits. At his funeral, which was a, a beautiful day, and I recognized many faces here that were there when he answered the last call and we laid him to rest. Great patriotic American leader. It was a tribute that day, a tribute long overdue. And then the Reserve Officers Association magazine, Troll Magazine, came out, and on the cover was Captain Bill. And inside was a phenomenal article that I've got to tell you has caused me to ask a lot of questions. And I salute those in this room who are continuing to ask those questions. And as a Marine, I'm proud to say that there were three Marines as crew members aboard the Liberty. Two lost their lives, and one, Bryce Lockwood, was decorated for saving lives, his heroic deeds. But Lockwood's heroic acts, my friends, weren't performed for the National Command Authority, the flag, or this great country. No, they were performed because they didn't want to let their fellow crew members down. For those who have never found themselves in a life-threatening situation, it is hard to fathom what drives a man to perform acts of bravery. But let me tell you all, whether it be soldiers, sailors, airmen, or Marines, is because the bond they have made with their squad, their air crew, their shipmates, that makes them step forth and do what needs to be done. I'm honored today to, to share the podium and, and this head table and to be in your presence as we honor Admiral Moore, a leader, a true warrior, who was known for taking care of the sailors that he was fortunate to have the opportunity to lead. The time-honored words of courage, commitment, dedication, determination, and loyalty were honed and given true meaning by Admiral Moore. Sir, I salute your service to our great country and if you read the back of the program of all that he accomplished, I am thankful that we had such men. And on this occasion, we all thank you for your efforts to, re to recognize the unsung heroes of the USS Liberty and your continued testimony to the support of the crew, their mission, and to have the truth told. Before I introduce the next speaker, I want to talk about the speaker that couldn't make it here. And he was the first person that I met from the Liberty in 1974. He was chief of nuclear medicine for the Navy at that time. <clears throat> Richard Kiefer is an incredible human being. And I'm sorry he's not here today. He was the only doctor aboard Liberty with those nearly 70% casualties. Uh, Dr. Keefe is a tall man, he's about 6'4". If you could bear with me a moment, I'd like to go through a couple of things about Dick Kiefer with you. This man, all these years later, has a scar on his left calf from right behind his knee to his ankle. His right knee was shattered by a piece of shrapnel. And he had 11 additional pieces of shrapnel in his abdomen which he held together with a life jacket. And this man stood on those legs for 21 consecutive hours, saving American lives and limbs that nobody had ever heard of. In 1973, there was a fire, a serious fire, at the Naval Air Base in Key West, Florida. And Dr. Kiefer, another Navy doctor from Texas, I believe, were ordered to go. There was a lot of sailors that were suffering uh, from smoke inhalation, and, and uh, so they needed some extra help. And um, 
Dr. Kiefer got aboard the Navy plane. There were six people on board. It crashed shortly after takeoff. Three died, three survived, including Dr. Kiefer. But he lost the use of his right arm. And imagine the surgeon losing his right arm. Dr. Kiefer is one of the greatest men I've ever met, and I wanted to impinge just for a moment on Admiral Moore's day to mention him, and I'm sorry he's not here, but I would like all of you to give that man a hand. Our next speaker is, a, is the incredible man in his own right. He was the chief engineer on board the Liberty. But his uh, past, even before that, was quite interesting. The war in the Pacific was almost over. I think it was in April of 45. And his ship at that time was the USS Hazelwood. And it was hit by two kamikazes. The ship sank. Out of a crew of nearly 400, he was one of 21 that survived. And since 74, in the meeting with uh, Kiefer, in the first interview with Tom Moore in 75, I've become a, a pretty good student of the events on June 8th and the attack of the Liberty. And I'm convinced that if George Goldman had not been in the engine room during that attack, we wouldn't be talking to any of these Liberty guys here today. It's with great pleasure that I introduce to you Commander George Goldman. I didn't write all of that. <laughs> Don't know where he got some of it from. But you know, I think it's once in a lifetime that you meet someone that you can really look up to from the first day you meet him until the last day that you see him. Admiral Moore is one of those persons. If a man falls in love with a man, there is nothing wrong with that because I certainly did with Admiral Moore. He was a person that I could call from Virginia Beach and talk to, and I knew that I could get answers to those questions. He was a person that everyone on the Liberty dearly loved. McGonagall was sort of like him. McGonagall lived close to me and him and his children, and we used to spend a lot of time at his house on Sundays because he liked to cook outside. I was up here in Washington, and I forget who it was, flew me up. It was an hour TV program. I was scared to death. But when they took me into that room just a few minutes before showtime, and I saw Admiral Moore setting up on that stage, it didn't like me so much that I knew that I could say the things that I wanted to do. And when some of the people got asking me some questions, I looked over at Admiral Moore. He says, go ahead and tell them, George. Tell them exactly how it happened. Tell them about the 800 and something rocket hits and our people dying. One little lady got up and she said something to me about, well, how did they die? And I asked her, I said, do you have a son? And she said, yes. I said, I remember seeing this one catch a rocket. Took him up beside the bulkhead of the ship. It just blood came down off of the side of that ship with his bones. And they were all just laying there. I said, now, do you want any more answers to questions such as this? And she says, no, sir. She said, well, how do you figure that there was 851 rocket hits? Because I counted them, and I had a couple of my people count them to make sure that what we said we had, we did have. I think with those that are here from the Liberty today would do and say the same things that I'm saying here today. He is a beloved friend of the Liberty Veterans Association. And we really missed him when we had our association meeting in Virginia Beach this year. It was not quite the same, but we knew where he was at. When I talked to him before he left to go out of the country, he wanted to be with us. And I know that his heart and mind was there with us even though that he wasn't in the flesh. I think that he will go down in history as one of our greatest admirals because he is an admiral. 
He's a gentleman and a scholar. It's been a pleasure for me and this association to not only know him, but to love him as well. The name of our next speaker is Clarence A. Hill, but nobody knows him. Right. It's Admiral Mark Hill. And he somehow survived being, a, the English would say, submariner uh, for two years during the Second World War. But he was also commander of the aircraft carrier USS Independence. Previous to that, he was executive officer on the Saratoga, which played a very critical role in the Liberty events of, of June 8th. Because another man I want to talk about just for a moment who can't be here and sends his regrets at me was it took me eight months to find this guy. His name is Terry Halbardier. And Halbardier was a radio man aboard the Liberty. And in the first few passes on the Liberty, Liberty was equipped with eight 40 foot whip antennas, four down each side of the ship. Only seven of them were connected. Uh, and they were all knocked out in the first two passes, so the Liberty couldn't yell for help. Mr. Albardier, at great risk to himself, reconnected that eighth antenna so that the Liberty was able to, to reach out to the Sixth Fleet and Captain Tully, who was the commander of, of the Saratoga. Um, let me get back to Mark Hill, so I just got off on Terry. He's a great man and, and a very brave man. And I was very glad that, that we could mention him on this program because he should have been here as well. You know, there was a very interesting thing that, that I'm trying to find. It. Yes, uh, Mark Hill, uh, during a, uh, a tour, about a two year tour as the chief of the Naval Mission to Brazil, uh, 69 to 71. Uh, he interceded with the Brazilian Navy, and it led to the, uh, the recovery of the American ambassador there who had been kidnapped. Anyway, it's, it's with great pleasure that, uh, that I introduce to you Admiral Mark Hill. Thank you very much, Mr. Howard. Uh, one of the things that Mr. Tito Howard said to me is that maybe uh, I could introduce some, uh, some levity in this thing because the, what happened to the Liberty is not a happy situation. And I guess uh, I can, from the standpoint of working with Admiral Moore, uh, from the time that I retired and he retired, in issues like the Liberty, that continue through so many other things, such as the Panama Canal, which he still has a great interest in. Uh, we now can say, I think openly, the shoot down of TW800. Uh, various other things have been hidden from the people and haven't been investigated by the Congress in the way that they should have had. If it hadn't been for Tom Moore, you all know where the liberty would have ended up in the, in the minds of the American people. So this is to me important. But one of his great characteristics, aside from the fact that he's willing to take on any issue, is a quick wit. A quick wit at a time when he can go right to the heart of something. Now, Bill Hauser's talked about the bombing. And that's how we got our prisoners back. You can talk to John McCain, you can talk to, to Jim Mulligan, you can talk to uh, Stockdale, anybody. It was that bombing that got them home. Well, at one time, of course, he was, at that time, was the, chief, uh, uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and evidently one reporter came up to him and said, well, now, uh, uh, Senator Chafee says that if he was back in the United States, he'd have stopped that. And right away, one more said, President Nixon wouldn't know John Chafee if he climbed into bed with him. <laughs> well, you see, you can cut right to the heart of something. <laughs> and it disarms the people <laughs> that are involved. Now, I've been in a couple of others uh, uh, with him, 
uh, and it, some of it rubbed off on me uh, because we would go together to see Senator so-and-so and Representative so-and-so about the big carrier program. And at one time, we were in Senator Child's office, and they always had the TV on, the, 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 the aides and the uh, young lady receptionists and so forth, what's going on on the floor, and it was the hearings for Judge Bork. And uh, what happened was, that a question was asked of Judge Bork, and Evan Moore, Tom Moore, turned to me and answered the question. <laughs> and then he looked at me and he said, I would have made a good judge, meaning yourself. <laughs> And before I could stop it, I came out and I said, Admiral, you would have been the only hanging judge we've ever had on this <laughs> But now one that will interest you. It was during the beginnings of the Reagan administration when one of the issues was, what do we do with the Minuteman? Each one of the services had their idea. The Air Force wanted to have a, a railroad tracks and, and run them around in certain periods at certain places, whether it be Utah or Nevada or up in the Dakotas. And the Army had the idea that they could carry that, that uh, in a different mode, and that is on the highway and trucks. Uh, and Admiral Moore came up with a different idea, and that was that we could have them as missiles launched from merchant ships. And we had been working, and he had, particularly at, at Point McGill and others when he was on active duty, with a method of dropping the missile in the water and having it take off um, from that as opposed to being uh, shot out from the submarine, which incidentally was the way that the Soviets launched their missiles, was just let it float to the surface in the, the Iraq. Well, we were invited to the Pentagon to discuss this with a high-powered group of which I was privileged to be present. Now, imagine a long table. On one end of it is the Deputy uh, uh, Secretary of Defense. He's sort of chairing the thing. On the side of the table I was on, two, two people from me was Melvin Laird, former Secretary of Defense. Right directly across from me was Richard Helms, former head of the CIA. Next to him was Admiral Tom Moore, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and next to him was a gentleman named Harold Brown, who was Assistant Secretary of Defense for R&D at the time the Liberty event happened, but had been just recently Jimmy Carter's Secretary of Defense. And each one of the, the people presented their idea. You, you know how much people would love to have nuclear tip missiles uh, in trucks on the Beltway. Uh, <laughs> and, and of course, uh, uh, Harold Brown had pushed the Air Force point of view, and Admiral Moore brought up what our Navy view was to use the the missile drop from merchant ships. His point was countered by Harold Brown, who said, "Oh, uh, it would be awfully easy to find out what ship those missiles were on." And Tom Moore turned to him and said, I don't know. The Israelis couldn't figure out it was a U.S. ship, the Liberty, with a big American flag on it. <laughs> and Richard Helms, of course, nudged him. Harold Brown was stone-faced, because he was part of that, that group. But Richard Helms, a big smile, came across his face, and he nudged Admiral Moore and said, you SOB. <laughs> Let me finish by saying this, that, that the great thing we have in the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Marine Corps has always been tradition. And it goes right back, back of course, to, um, to John Paul Jones and to Preble, and Preble who had the Constitution first and the Barbary Pirates with a bunch of young fellows that he called just a bunch of boys, and they became Preble's boys. And we go from there, we go to, to, to all of the greats since then. Right up to Chester Nimitz, right up to Arleigh Burke, Mark Mitchell, etc. But you know, when the Constitution under Preble was leaving the May, 
and was going for the Pillar of Hercules. Horatio Nelson had his flag at the time in Gibraltar. And he watched the Constitution come about smartly as it got through the, the, the Straits and headed for the U.S. And he said, those Americans, the way they handle their transatlantic ships, they're going to give us some trouble someday. And it's exactly the way things happened with Preble's boys who became the great leaders of our Navy in the War of 1812 on to the present. And there are a lot of people here who know that we would not have the Theodore Roosevelt, we would not have the Washington and Lincoln today if it weren't for Admiral Moore. And there are people like Bill Hauser and Jerry Miller, and Whitey Feitner and Phil Beshney and so forth, and the greatest accolade we can ever have is that we were Moore's boys. Thank you. Jack Tiller was in the military a lot of years ago. He, he attained a huge rank, I hate to even say it in this room, of Navy Lieutenant. <laughs> but he's a mountain of talent. He's a composer of music. He will be doing the music on the film that we're putting together now on the Liberty. Uh, the man has won an Emmy and an Oscar in music. He did the National Geographic specials for 27 years. All of the Jacques Cousteau series that was filmed in the United States, Jack did. He's been a very dear friend of mine with his charming wife, Joyce, over there. And I'm very, very happy to introduce a very fine and very talented gentleman to you, Jack Tucker. Honored today, Admiral, Mrs. Moore, other admirals, crew, and relatives. Uh, I'm from Hollywood, and I've never seen so many stars <laughs> in one place. Uh, we all get to make choices, and it struck me that Dr. Howard is made a choice to commit to this uh, need to have truth and justice out. And with so many noble allies, it's going to ultimately be easy. Uh, I was honored last year to work on the film Return with Honor. And that was from Stoppin. It was with John McCain, and uh, that was the first time that I had really cried while working on a picture. You know, I'm a pretty emotional guy, and I do feel that the reason that we come to turning points in our life is to test us and to make noble choices. We all have to do that, and we all have to do it in a uh, serious and calculated way. So I thank you beyond uh, anything I can say for letting me work on this. No more Friday the 13th or <laughs> sitcoms or shoot 'em ups. We all get choices. I propose that we all keep taking the noble road. I was so moved at the footage that I'd seen on the Liberty that I jotted down something. I'm uh, now in my later life moving toward Broadway and writing musicals. So I call this loss of liberty America, proud and mighty America, you now must hear our call the loss of liberty for one is loss of liberty for all. And when our call is heeded, and when you right this wrong, and when you do what's needed, then, and only then, again, you will be strong. Thank you.
I told you he'd tell. Our next speaker is Tom Kilfine. I, I asked him if his name indicated that he didn't write country music. Fancy Klein. Anyway, um, Admiral Kilpine was born in Kokomo, Indiana, graduated from the Navy Academy in 1949, and like most of the admirals here, he was a, a Navy a flyer. I think if you capsulize the last 50 years of Navy air power, most of it's in this room today. Um, Tom was uh, twice a test pilot. And uh, he was commander of the Atlantic Navy Forces and for nine years was president of the Retired Officers Association. And when I was trying to coordinate this and I spoke to Bill Hauser and Mark Hill and said, you know, we're all going to be talking about how terrific this man is. Uh, would you mind picking on him a little bit, anecdotally perhaps? And then I got to Tom Kilkline, and uh, I suggested the same thing. And he said, not me. <laughs> <laughs> he said, when I was a lieutenant, he was already an admiral. <laughs> Tom Kilkline. Thank you, Dr. Hearn. <clears throat> that last remark was, uh, was very appropriate. Um, <laughs> You know, we all meet great people in our lives, and uh, my association with uh, uh, Admiral Moore started a long time ago. I was a lieutenant, about to become lieutenant commander. Uh, in the Mediterranean, I was uh, aide to George Anderson, who was the fleet commander. And this uh, young admiral comes out with his ship, he was a Carrier Division 6 commander, and we had a uh, get together in Con France where the Saratoga and the, and the flagship were located. Uh, it was interesting social conversation. Uh, the ship was due to uh, an overnight trip for, from Con to Barcelona, and my uh, pretty young bride said, Gee, that sounds great. Can we? Uh, you know, take some people, can we uh, go, over, go over with you? And uh, Admiral Moore uh, looked at him and said, Sir, uh, well, you want to go? Uh, be at the landing in the morning, and uh, you can use my flight, my in import cabin. Uh, and then she stops and thinks a minute and says, Won't you have to ask the fleet commander? And he said, This is my ship. <laughs> I, I, you know, here I, I'm just a youngster, just beginning to understand what some of these people are doing. It, it made a lot of sense, frankly. It was his ship. He had the responsibility for it, uh, and I and you knew he was going to inform the fleet commander, but he was going to do something that was right. Nothing wrong with it. Uh, it was the appropriate thing to do. Uh, he knew it would be put together, and it was my introduction to. Uh, a man who knew where he was going, who had confidence and common sense, and uh, that's, along with all the other assets, uh, it was interesting to note that uh, he, he was a, <clears throat> uh, a junior, a junior, not only was a lower half, I think it's the only time in his whole career he was ever called anything lower than that. <laughs> Look, but he, he was on the, on the fast track at that point. He was in such a hurry to make, uh, to become the CNO and the chairman that they didn't have time to put him in command of a carrier. He had, <laughs> he'd had a small carrier, but uh, uh, it, it was uh, impressive. I didn't serve with him while he was on active duty. I saw him. I heard him testify in Congress. Uh, we all watched him with, with awe, which I still do. Um, I remember when we, uh, 1974, uh, there was a retirement ceremony and uh, the retiring chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff was kind enough to let the CNO also share the, the ceremony. 
the master ceremonies was a retired officer who had a reputation, a great storyteller, <coughs> had a great sense of humor. Uh, but from that, that experience, the experience of that evening, uh, I made up my mind that there was no way I was going to try to roast or to kid Admiral Tom Moore. <laughs> uh, it was a wonderful evening. It was well done, but uh, <coughs> there's, there's an aura about the man, and I used the word a minute ago about all. Uh, he has so much intelligence, common sense. Uh, when I did get to know him a lot better was after we retired, and even after I had retired, which was several years later. Um, when he took on the issues, he was the willing spokesman for some very difficult things. He didn't mind getting on TV and answering the tough questions. Uh, he was setting a standard in, in helping to educate a lot of people that there were senior people in the United States who had some very strong feelings and who knew how to express them. It was a as far as I'm concerned, it was an exciting time, and every time we said, I don't know was on TV, I'd run and turn around and find out what he was talking about now, because it was going to be something strong, something intelligent, and with courage, uh, kind of things that, you, that make you proud. Uh, like all mental officers are supposed to be, he was always training. And he put on an example of that just last Friday. Last Friday, uh, the Midshipman Naval Academy had their first uh, dress parade in his honor. Um, he, after it was all over, he was invited to speak to the brigade on the large field. Uh, I envy him. Anybody can stand up as he did and in a very short period of time, say some very significant things and very nicely, and then end up addressing himself to the midshipmen. With another lesson, he talked about Carrie. He talked about her, not only love, but the importance in trying to get across to those young men and women who were going to have to make some interesting decisions. It's probably a subject that they had never heard, at least from the Navy before, but how important she was in his life and in his career. Uh, kind of thing that most people wouldn't want to get up in front of. The thousands of people, there were four different people who came classes holding the reunions that were there, the parents that were there. It was just the most fitting thing and the most appropriate comments, which is very typical. Admiral Tom Moore. Carrie, uh, you and Admiral Tom Moore are something very, very special to Darnell and I. And we, and I, 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 know, I do. I think Darnell shared it. We all did. We hold you both. Thank you. I want to mention Brooksy. Everybody here with the liberty to know is Brooksy. Very few of the Liberty sailors did not raise up to the ferocity of, 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 of this attack. Uh, with the 851 rocket and cannon hulls, there were over 3,000 holes from armor-piercing bullets. And one of the few sailors who did not rise up to it was the man that uh, Commander Golden asked to go up and uh, and drain the boilers and the above deck, because if those were hit, that would have that broken the, the ship in half with, uh, with a 40 by 48 foot hole at the waterline. <coughs> and so this man collapsed, and uh, bounding over him was Brooks, James Brooks over here, very brave American sailor. And within minutes after he went up there, great risk, and those boilers, they were hit. And again, 
we wouldn't be honoring them with the Admiral today. Please give Brooksy a hand. Israeli claim of mistaken identity was not only could a one-eyed Mong Mongolian tailor tell the difference between the Liberty and the Al-Qasir, if they want us to believe, they want us to believe their story that they thought it was the Egyptian ship Al-Qasir. Why in the world did they jam all five American emergency radio channels by the attacking aircraft? To quote Admiral Moore again, ludicrous. I want to introduce Mr. Pogler to you now and pay attention to him and fill in again. Well, I have the honor of uh, being here to present a, an additional presentation other than the clap to Admiral Moore. Uh, but before I do that, I would like to uh, share with you uh, the, the, all the words have been said, how courageous he is, and his integrity and courageous uh, had a lot to do with my recovery from post-traumatic stress disorder. When I returned to Norfolk, I was... Uh, told not to speak about it, and uh, for 20 years I tried to do that. In 1985, uh, I started losing my vision. Uh, optometrist told me uh, that I didn't, he didn't think I had an eye problem, I had a physical problem. I should uh, go to a doctor and get a physical. So I went to a doctor, and the doctor walked back in after the test and said, you should be dead. He said, uh, your blood pressure is 240 over 145. It's obviously been that way for quite a while to do the damage to the eyes that have been done. He says, I don't know why you're still walking around. And uh, a year later after that, uh, I drove off the side of the road on my way home on the San Diego freeway uh, in California, that's where I live, and uh, found that after about five minutes I was sitting there crying and thinking about the ship. I had uh, so successfully buried it that in 1982, when there was a bad plane crash in, over San Diego, <clears throat> I was listening to a radio station, and they said they were going to send all the policemen and uh, firemen to counseling for uh, guilt feelings over having to pick up the bodies of the plane crash. And I very intellectually thought, hmm, I picked up uh, my 25 shipmates down where I worked because I had, was a CT, and uh, those good people don't even know the people they're picking up. And it was a nice intellectual exercise, but uh, there was no emotional reaction. It was four years later before I finally uh, drove off the side of the road and realized the impact this had had on me. So when I went to the vet center in Anaheim to try and deal with survivor's guilt, my anger and rage because I'd been abandoned and beat up, um, one of the first things I had to do was figure out what can I do. I mean, 20 years ago, I, you weren't supposed to say that Liberty was an intelligent ship. Well, a shipmate of mine sent me an audio tape in which Admiral Moore had introduced the Liberty subject to the audience, and he had said the, the uh, naval intelligence ship. And I thought, hmm, well, if the uh, Chairman, ex-chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff can call it an intelligence ship, I guess I can too. That may seem like a, a small thing to, uh, to uh, Washington, but uh, who's someone who has buried themselves and, and, and isolated themselves for years, that, that was a very significant thing for me. It started me on the road to being able to talk about my experience. Um, I also have heard times when he has spoke about the liberty in a question and answer session and uh, almost been badgered by people in the audience about various things. And over the years I've thought, why would this man do this? We're uh, 250 guys, no particular wealth, 
uh, our political cloud, if it was dynamite, uh, couldn't blow over a thimble. So finally, I came to the conclusion that after isolating myself for 20 years and uh, realizing how that I felt like there were no honest people in Washington, that maybe that wasn't true. And he was like a bolt of lightning, lightning that I grabbed onto to say there are real people that, that work and live in Washington. And so he was a very significant part of my recovery. Uh, so with that, I would like to present him with a picture of the ship underscored with uh, several of the medals we were awarded and surrounded by as many signatures as I could acquire. Captain McGonagall at, at Arlington and a, and a very interesting series of events took place. At, I don't know how the Navy did this, you know, maybe some of you can help me, but at the precise moment after Barney and uh, Admiral Moore and uh, Cindy McGonagall spoke at the pretty little chapel near Arlington. We went to the gravesite and just at the moment where the honor guard is passing, you know how they put it in a triangle, the American flag, and, and is handing it to a daughter of Captain McGarrett at that precise moment, there was this explosion of sound as Four F-14s flew in salute to Captain McGonagall. You know how one peels off and goes heavenwards. And I've worked with a lot of camera people in a lot of places. And uh, our camera lady, Sandy Flynn, was concentrating to get Cindy McGonagall's face as she was receiving this way. And somehow, I'm only three feet to her left, she spins around way over her right shoulder and nails that shot. So spirit had to be working somewhere. I'm, I'm still amazed at that. We left the Goddard's gravesite and we went to another part of Arlington where I thank Colonel Howard for educating me, raising me, feeding me, clothing me putting up with my nonsense all those years. But then we left Arlington, and there were five major television stations in the Washington area. It's a very important news market, not just because of the seat of government, but because all the other countries of the world have their embassies here. So we had called all five television stations in Washington. Three of them were even rude in saying they didn't want to come to see this American Medal of Honor winner buried. As we said, please send a crew, or letting you know about it, or if you like, we have two cameras there, we will send you some footage. One, Channel 5, said they were interested and would send somebody, but they didn't. But there had been some indication of interest from Channel 7. So we went directly from Arlington Channel 7, and were confronted by this tough, hard-nosed, knowledgeable newsman, a fellow hiding behind that beard over there. And he had the courage to put it on the air that night, 11 o'clock news on Channel 7. And so, for the first time for most of them, 160,000 people in the nation's capital heard the words USS Liberty for the first time 14 times. And from that, 
the reserve, the retired officer's magazine, was planning an article on Bill McGonagall anyway. But the impetus by, by one guy over there, McGonagall was on the cover, and the article was increased by about 40%. And unfortunately, a very charming, bright woman couldn't make it today. She's at the dentist. But Nan O'Leary, so any of you run into Miss O'Leary at the Retired Officers Magazine, we tell her thank you for all of us. We, you know, I want, before I get off of that, 460,000 American get households get that magazine. Admiral, it's no longer a secret, finally. And this event, I hope, will help stimulate action and, and interest in an American ship that lost its captain, captain's gig, the whale boat, which held about 30 men, and all 18 life rafts were left alone for 17 hours before the USS Davis came alongside the next morning. I want each of you here to applaud Charlie Norton for his courage. I think he started an impetus that's going to be very, very difficult to stop. I want to introduce you now to, to a very brave uh, American, a man who's become a very good friend of mine, uh, Philip J. Turner. Thank you. Well, first of all, Tito uh, made a mistake. Uh, he called me a seaman, and I work real hard for my crow. <laughs> so I don't want you to call me a seaman. <laughs> As, as Don was saying, in the early 80s, uh, I heard Admiral uh, Moore speak here in Washington, D.C. alone with Rick. He was on the panel. And uh, that's the first time I uh, thought about the liberty uh, at all. And when I heard you spoke, when you, when you spoke the liberty and how you felt about it, uh, you made me very, very proud to be an American again. And I thank you, sir. It was uh, your words that... Uh, inspired me to work as hard as I could for the Liberty Veterans Association. Uh, and most importantly, uh, uh, my Navy career was, was training and what, what training did for me and how, how good the Navy treated me. I loved the Navy. Uh, it wasn't the Navy's fault that they didn't come help us. It was a political decision. It wasn't the Navy's fault. And I don't think any, sh any crew member uh, playing the Navy at all. We all love the Navy. Proud to serve it. Proud to be on the Liberty. Uh, we've gone through a lot of things in the last 14 or 15 years. Uh, we've got a library named the USS Liberty Memorial Library in Grafton, Wisconsin. We have uh, many, many other things. Uh, but th this, I don't want to talk about that. This is Admiral Moore's day. And I'm not going to be real long because uh, I'm really... Uh, not the best speaker, but I, I have it, a lot of it in my heart. It means a lot to me, and I know all of my shit names. Uh, if, if you would, I would like Warren Haney and Dave Lucas to stand up, please. Chief Brooks, Rick Ametti, John Murkowski, Ernie Gallo, Joe Lentini. I would like you to uh, give Admiral Moore a hand, and before you do, I'd like you to give all the rest of these admirals that help uh, make this country what it is. And uh, we all salute you and thank you for your service to this country. Thank you very much. I would, I would like to uh, present Admiral Moore with, the, with our plaque now. And if, if Rick Ametti and Chief Brooks would get up, please. It's a pretty heavy uh, plaque, so you guys get a good grip on it. <laughs> oh. 
I'll go ahead and read what the plaque says now. The officers and crew of the USS Liberty survivors of the unprovoked attack by Israel on June 8, 1967, expresses their internal gratitude to Admiral Thomas H. Moore for his strong and steadfast support. Support. This is the first annual Liberty Award, and we'll be giving out an award to uh, people that uh, we hold dear in our hearts every year from now on. And uh, again, Admiral, all the, all the survivors here, and I know everybody in this room, deeply uh, respect you and love you and wish you all the best of health and wealth and happiness with your beautiful bride. Thank you, sir. Thank you. appreciation to every one of you for being here today and also uh, in particular to those who have had these uh, uh, associations with me and came up with all those nice stories <laughs> that I'd almost forgotten about. <laughs> but anyway, this meeting is about an episode in uh, uh, heroics and tragedy that marked the attack, the assault on the USS Duluth. And the facts are that uh, uh, the Israelis uh, uh, attacked the Liberty without any warning. They used uh, uh, machine guns, rockets, napalm, bombs, and torpedoes. And, uh, Nevertheless, uh, uh, they uh, said, as a matter of fact, that they mistook the liberty for an Egyptian ship. Well, this Egyptian ship was about half the size and uh, looked absolutely nothing uh, like the Louvre. And on top of that, the facts are that the Israelis, as everyone knows, are highly trained military people. The results that they achieve in battle speak for themselves. So it's almost impossible for me to believe that a pilot uh, uh, in the vicinity of the Liberty didn't know exactly uh, what that ship was. And consequently, I have to come to the conclusion that that attack was directed from headquarters and uh, was conducted in such a way that uh, the uh, target was uh, certainly agreed to by all hands. Now, people will uh, dispute that it was an accident and so on, but certainly as I look back, the uh, cover-up on the part of the Israelis, as well as the cover-up on the part of the United States government, was uh, uh, certainly inexcusable. As a matter of fact, uh, on two occasions, the Saratoga and the America, two big carriers in the Mediterranean, uh, launched and directed uh, aircraft to go to the rescue of the Liberty and in both cases, those aircraft were recalled from Washington. And consequently, the Israeli attack had the maximum effect on, on the liberty. Now, I have been quoted as saying that uh, had uh, that story 
been uh, written up as fiction that no one in his right mind would agree with it. And so uh, I know that uh, many of you are tired. I, I, we've been sitting here now for quite a while, and, but nevertheless, uh, I uh, simply uh, want to say that the position I took after June the 8th, 1967, and the position I take today is exactly the same. Thank you. all of you to give a cord and a recognition to the officers and men of the USS Liberty. A brave fighting outfit, although they had little or no defensive weapons. <laughs>